Hello, this is a re-record of this problem from today's lecture. I forgot to uh, forgot to hit record until the next slide, but uh, we're trying to convert 225 liters into cubic meters. Now, what I really hope that we know in order to make this conversion is this. I hope we know that there's one cubic centimeter in one milliliter. But this is really the only conversion factor we need to know, other than a couple obvious ones, like there's a thousand milliliters in a liter, and then there's 100 centimeters in one meter. So 1,000 milliliters in a, a liter and 100 centimeters in a meter. Okay, so we could possibly know a direct conversion factor, and if we know a direct cubic meter to liter conversion factor, we can use it. The problem is we have to know it. You probably won't be given that one on a test. Sometimes we give you this one, but this is really pretty obvious that we're going to know this one if we don't already. Pretty well that's an exact conversion in fact all these conversions are exact here and so if I'm trying to determine the number of cubic meters starting from 225 liters I might convert to milliliters so let's do two, two, 225 liters times a thousand not a thousand times one liter is a thousand milliliters one milliliter is one cubic centimeter. And then when I go to make this conversion here, I have to be a little careful. 100 centimeters to one meter, I have to cube my conversion factor. How do we do this, or how do I know, or why do we do that? Well, think of a cube that's one meter by one meter by one meter. So one cubic meter would be equal to 100 centimeters times 100 centimeters times 100 centimeters. That would be equal to 100 centimeters cubed, which would be equal to 100 cubed centimeters cubed. And so when I look at my conversion factor here, I need to cube the entire conversion factor. So one cubic meter is 100 cubed centimeters cubed. So to cube the factor, we cube the hundred, we cube centimeters. And make sure you can put this in a calculator. Make sure you get the right result when you do a hundred, excuse me, when you do 225 times a thousand, divide by a hundred carat three, using this button on your calculator, or doing a hundred with the XY button, and then three, having some approach for entering a hundred to the power of three. So 100 times 100 times 100. Or just do 225 times 1,000 divided by 100, divide by 100, divide by 100. And that'll get you the right result of answer C, 0.225 cubic meters. Now, there are a variety of cubic conversion factors that you can use, and sometimes you'll see these in different problems. Like if you need to convert cubic inches to cubic centimeters, let's say you're looking at a cubic inch, and you're trying to convert this to cubic centimeters, well, you just use the inch to centimeter conversion, which is 2.54. Then we have to cube 2.54. So one inch by one inch by one inch would be 2.54 by 2.54 by 2.54 cubic centimeters. Or if you have to convert uh, cubic feet to cubic inches, well, there's 12 inches in a foot, so there's 12 cubed inches cubed and one cubed feet cubed. So one cubic feet, so one foot by one foot by one foot is 12 by 12 by 12 inches. As luck would have it, I just forgot to record, so I'm just starting the recording on slide two. It's actually fairly easy for me to go re-record slide one. So if you, if you watch the video, you'll see a different recording of that first slide, because um, I forgot to hit the record button. Um, hopefully I start remembering to do that, because that is always annoying. Okay, so we're recording now on slide two. Um, if you're looking for these slides, modules, recitation, or modules, lecture slides. There's also a module for recitations. If you haven't seen it, that's where we put recitation keys at the end of the week. Um, starting this week, I'll be uploading like a recitation solution video so that you can watch a video of the solutions if you missed any or want to see those problems again. There's also a daily quiz page that I make for my class that um, has a bunch of quizzes that you can take that kind of go along with the course. And a lot of those have video solutions as well. Um, so check those out.
They all have keys as well, so you can just, in mostly multiple choice, so you can check out a quiz, quickly take a five or 10 question quiz, see how well you're doing, and to get some uh, help on uh, what material you might need to review. And one final note on the online homework, just as a, a general announcement, um, I wanted to mention, scores in Carmen aren't going to update live as you're, do, as, as you're doing assignments and mastering. So if you check Carmen and it's, it shows a different score than you see on mastering, eventually it'll update. It just takes it some time to update. It's sporadic, I have no idea. It's hard for me to even understand when it's updating. It's like maybe once an hour or something like that. Um, so just know that that's a thing. And then also, if you're finding yourself struggling with um, the mastering chemistry, the grades are pretty high, so I don't think it's um, that, that common it's, that you guys are struggling on the homework. If you are, just look at some of the problems in the book, look at some of the readings. The problems are coming right from the textbook. You can actually get a chance to do most of the problems in the book, um, in the e-text reader version, um, before you actually take the homework, and you'll see you can have like one chance to try the problem if you need it, and then the homework being a second chance to show that you remember the problem. So just a little bit of help um, to get you started on that online homework. Okay, so getting into chapter two here, the topic of chapter two um, is getting into some actual like chemistry topics away from the math topics of the uh, second half of chapter one, and getting into atoms, molecules, ions. The first half of the chapter is going to be about um, how we know about some of the subatomic particle theory of matter. I'm sure you all remember the, the, the thoughts of atoms being comprised of protons, neutrons, electrons. So we'll talk about some of those fundamental experiments that went into us knowing uh, those details about atoms. Um, and then as we get into the second half of the chapter, we'll start talking about atoms forming uh, bonds and different types of compounds. So we'll look at some different molecules, look at some periodic trends of different elements on the periodic table. And then the last like third of the chapter um, is really the meat of this chapter is on naming compounds. So we go through a different, uh, few different classes of compounds, like ionic compounds, things like sodium chloride. We'll go through um, some molecular compounds like hydrocarbons, alcohols, like methane, methanol, ethane, ethanol, things like that. And then we'll also get into naming um, like acids, so things like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. Um, and then we'll name like a few other like small categories of compounds um, towards the end of the chapter. So that's our basic like overview of chapter two. Now getting started, the first section in chapter two kind of gets into um, thinking of matter as being comprised of atoms. Th this theory began as early as um, the early 1800s. Uh, John Dalton kind of proposed some atomic sort of theory of matter postulates. And this was without the aid of any kind of knowledge of the actual composition of matter. This was just thinking, well, what are things probably uh, comprised of based off of what experiments were known at the time? At this moment in time, we didn't know about electrons, protons, neutrons, things like that. That's about 100 years later that we're going to discover those details of atoms. And so Dalton began to sort of postulate that elements are probably comprised of particles that we can think of as being atoms, and that atoms of the same element would be you know, more or less identical to each other. You might know, you may be aware of isotopes, that a particular element can exist as uh, two different isotopes. We'll see some examples of that with like carbon-12 versus carbon-13. Uh, but at this time, there's no thought of isotopes as being a thing. So the, the, the thought at this time would have been, if we have a sample of copper, we have a sample of zinc, that all the atoms of copper are identical to each other, all the atoms of zinc are identical to each other. Um, a thought at the time, and this is like generally a pretty good thought, is that we're not going to like turn copper into zinc. That like copper is copper, zinc is zinc. There's no chemical means that we're going to have to, to transform one element into another element. So once you have an element of carbon, it's stuck as being carbon. Now, you might be aware from physics, or if you had like a, a really solid AP class that got into nuclear chemistry, you might be aware of some nuclear reactions that are going on um, at all times where different atoms are, through radioactive decay, converting to other atoms. And those are reactions that do take place. Generally, they're pretty slow. Um, but those reactions aren't like chemical reactions. Those aren't reactions that we can just direct. We can't just like take a sample of one element and turn it into another chemically even though there might be a slow process over the course of time where some atom is decaying um, through some radioactive pathways. Um, and then compounds can form when we start interconverting elements with each other. So we can take elements and mix them together. Um, and this gives us like the law of like definite proportions. So if elements are going to react, if you're gonna get carbon and oxygen to react, usually it's in a ratio of one C to one O2 unit to form like a CO2 that you get the you know, so whole number of ratios of elements combining to form compounds is the, 
usual way of things going. So that's the law of either definite or multiple proportions that you can take things like C and O and form CO2. Um, you can take other elements, maybe like aluminum and oxygen and form things like Al2O3. So maybe we can take like aluminum and O2 and form Al2O3 and this specific count of atoms turns out to be a stable compound. We'll get into later why that's the case and how we could have predicted that. Um, and then, you know, even later we'll get into like actually balancing this reaction. So let's worry about balancing this reaction later, but the idea, actually let's take a moment and balance it just so you can see the proportions is what I, the only reason I'm mentioning this slide here is that, uh, or this reaction here, is that in this particular reaction you would have four aluminums combining with three oxygens specifically to get the right ratio and the right count so that we have the same number of aluminum atoms on both sides of the reaction and then the same number of oxygen atoms on both sides of the reaction. Chapter three gets into more classifications of reactions, balancing them and, and all that fun stuff, and then quantifying details of chemical reactions. So we have some of that to come in the next chapter, but what we're seeing here, this is like a four to three ratio. So we get these like definite sort of, or sort of like proportions of reactants reacting to form compounds because we have to keep the elements ratios specific to whatever they form within those different compounds. We also have the law of conservation of mass, so we're not destroying elements or creating elements through the course of reactions, we're just ch changing the way they bond with each other. So of course we have to have, you know, if we have a reaction take place, we should have the same number of, of atoms on the reactant side and the product side. Okay, so the, um, I've only shown this with a picture, we have this like demo where I can show this with a demo. The um, discovery of the electron happened in uh, 1897, J.J. Thompson. Uh, what he did was an experiment much like the one we can do over here. And so what we have is a high voltage source that's creating uh, an arc of, well, what at the time was known what it was, but ended up being an electron. And so we're putting a high voltage arc on a gas sample, and so then I can use this magnet wand to kind of bend or arc the particle. And so this experiment here measured the charge to mass ratio of the electron was one of the details that this experiment uh, determined. And the, um, 
that's credited with the discovery of the electron. And so the experiment discovered the electron and then determined the mass to charge ratio. That's not a number worth memorizing, but the thought is from this experiment that they got the ratio of the mass to charge, but not necessarily the mass itself of the electron. The mass of the electron is going to come from a second experiment that's important to discuss, and that's the Millikan oil drop experiment. So this experiment done a little bit later, um, 1909, what it was doing was it was atomizing an oil spray and then using a similar approach of an X-ray to try to create um, a negative charge, but suspended on those atomized oil droplets. And then the atomized oil droplets ended up containing maybe one electron's worth of charge or two electrons worth of charge or three electrons worth of charge. And then by orienting the apparatus downward, they could use the, fall, the, the rate of falling of these particles versus gravity to kind of determine if they contained one versus two versus three uh, electrons. And then from the uh, experiment, there's a problem in the homework that I don't particularly care for. There's like a couple of instructors that like these problems. I, I don't think they're all that instructive to actually see how the math works behind uh, this experiment. But what this experiment was ultimately able to do was determine the mass of the electron. And so from the mass to charge ratio in the previous uh, experiment, this one was able to determine the actual uh, mass of the electron. And then it also determined the charge of the electron. Um, you might recognize this number if you've seen it in physics before. It's um, 1.609 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, negative for that negative particle electron. And so uh, the mass of this electron is much lighter than hydrogen. So this is really establishing kind of two details. One is that it clearly is subatomic. It's not like we were taking that atom and forming some smaller atom because it would have been a much more massive uh, amount of mass. Um, and then it was uh, a, a very light particle um, as well. So we're forming a very light particle um, as it's being given off, and then therefore it has to be subatomic. So it's lighter than the lightest atom, much lighter. It's about one two thousandth the mass of um, the, the hydrogen atom, which is the lightest atom or the light element. And so then there are other experiments that were done. This was actually kind of in the meantime between the oil drop experiment and uh, the uh, discovery of the electron. Uh, Marie Curie was discovering radioactivity pathways in 1903 by taking a radioactive substance, a substance that produces uh, different radioactive pathways. Um, I think it was uranium. I can't remember what element it was. But the particular um, element that was radioactive was giving off three different rays. And the way you can tell it's giving off three rays was that if you had some sort of a screen, this was much like an old cathode ray tube TV screen where you had like a phosphor screen that would light up if the particle hits it. And then you can bend the particle, one of the particles, just like we did before, um, and that's the beta ray. So if you took a magnetic wand to this, you would find some of the particles would be deflected upwards, but not all the particles. So we take a magnetic wand, we find that we end up forming these beta rays. Well, these are the electrons. That's the exact same particle that we were actually seeing in J.J. Uh, Thompson's experiment. So uh, a negative uh, deflection of those particles upwards from the magnetic field, those were the same electrons that we were seeing in the cathode ray tube experiment. So the CRT's cathode ray tube experiment, same particle. And then, but a, a second particle emerged going downward. So a second particle emerged that was moving downward on the screen, um, and that had to therefore carry a positive charge, but it was barely deflected downward. Just uh, the, the screen's making it look maybe a little more than what it was. But the electron is going really high because it had a really light mass. And then this um, alpha ray was actually just going down a little bit because it actually had more of a mass. And so this particle later was determined to be the helium nucleus. So this turned out to be the helium-4 nucleus, which we'll talk in a minute about like how this is the mass number, this is an atomic number. We'll talk a little bit later about what those numbers correspond to. But at the time, they didn't know what it was. They just knew that it was you know, probably some sort of an atom with a positive charge, positive charge because it's going downward, and then more massive because it wasn't going downward as much as the electron was going upward. And then there was a third particle, well, it actually wasn't a particle at all. The third one was just an actual ray of light. It was electromagnetic energy, wasn't a particle, couldn't make a pinwheel move, for example. So this was just a photon of light. Really high energy light, um, so, uh, uh, but we call that the gamma ray. So the gamma rays were being given off a really high energy, even higher energy than an X-ray. So this radioactive substance here was giving off three natural decay pathways. One was generating an electron, 
Another was generating a helium nucleus. And then another was just giving off a high packet of electromagnetic energy or light, um, greater in energy than an X-ray. Now, um, I believe Curie died very young from all the radioactivity, uh, all these rays passing um, through her body, unfortunately. Um, so these aren't things you want to be near um, if you can avoid it, especially those gamma uh, rays and alpha rays. But the, um, what this was showing us, though, was what the sort of atoms are comprised of, that they're comprised of negative charge, negative electrons, and then more massive particles giving up the pos you know, yielding that positive charge. So one last experiment to talk about that kind of helps us set the stage for what we know about atoms and how we came to know it was Rutherford's gold foil experiment, 1910. This is kind of a, an interesting experiment where um, going in, I think that they had a, a wrong model what they thought atoms were comprised of. Going into the experiment, they had this like sort of thought that an atom would look like, like a, a, a single sphere that contained all the positive and negative particles together was the kind of thought going into this experiment. So they thought that, and, and you probably know the atom has a nucleus. Like we know now the atom has a nucleus, but this is how we're going to come to know the atom has a nucleus or support that, um, that idea. So if the positive charge and neutral charge, we're going to see neutrons in a minute. If, if those particles are in the nucleus and those light electrons are spinning outside the nucleus, then what's going to happen when we have a sheet of gold foil is we're going to have a lot of nuclei that aren't like overlapping each other. We take a really thin piece of gold foil, you might think, how many nuclei are there that are like overlapping each other? Because those are the, the massive centers in the atom. If a particle hits the nucleus, it's probably going to deflect backwards. But it'll probably go straight through if there's no space in between for, um, you know, so, so if it hits the nucleus, it's going to come backwards, and then it's going to go straight through otherwise. Then if you think about this atom, if, if you just had the model of the atom where you didn't have the nucleus with all those protons and neutrons in it, all that positive and neutral charge, if you don't have that compact nucleus, then everything should go right through, the entire beam should go right through the gold foil. So they shot the alpha particle, so this is that helium nucleus. I think it's relatively important to say that we know it now to be the helium nucleus, but they're taking this positive particle, relatively massive, and they're like, okay, we're gonna shoot it at this gold foil, and it's probably gonna go right through it. So they're expecting to find that all the particles would go straight through the gold foil. And what they ended up finding was that they had all kinds of scattering. So they were seeing scattering of those particles, even some of them like backscattering, and that backscattering and the scattering is due to those particles hitting or deflecting off the massive nucleus. And um, you just can't really come up with a model that would show that what should be a relatively small proton or neutron should be able to deflect um, the, uh, the, the scatter those particles in that same way. And so I like this quote down here um, from Ernest Rutherford who um, did the experiment. You know, it was quite the most incredible event that, had, that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you'd fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. you know, so that's you know, how surprised they were when they got this result. You know, they're shooting a massive particle at a thin sheet, thinking it would go straight through, and saw this backscattering, and completely changed the way that we think about the structure of atoms and how we, um, you know, and how we then thought of them moving forward. And so this set the stage for the nuclear model of matter that we've probably started learning about in like seventh or eighth grade science. Okay, so um, just to get, give a little summary of kind of like what you might want to, you know, know from those couple slides that we just talked about. Probably like names and ideas and some conclusions. Um, I think the rough timeline is somewhat helpful just to kind of know when these things are happening relative to like the discovery of um, atomic theory almost 100 years before these experiments are trying to get into subatomic particle, particle theory and the actual structure of the atom theory. But ray, cathode ray tube, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron and the mass to charge ratio. Oil drop experiment dis discovered the electron charge and hence the uh, mass of the electron found it was a subatomic particle, really light mass. Uh, Curie's radioactivity pathways showed the different radioactive decay pathways leading to alpha, beta, and gamma rays. One of those was that same electron as we were seeing before. Um, and then Rutherford's alpha uh, scattering gold foil experiment used the alpha particle, that helium nucleus, so I think it's important to know that this alpha particle was being used from the discovery um, within uh, Curie's work. We're using that particle 
to try to see if it would go through a sheet of gold, and some of those particles were backscattered and deflected, pointing towards the nuclear model of the atom. So Rutherford's gold, alpha scattering gold foil experiment discovered the nuclear model of the atom. And then um, some further discoveries where we don't talk about the actual experiment that goes into the discovery. Uh, the protons uh, formally discovered in 1919 um, as a particle, and then the uh, neutron in 1932. So the neutron itself, um, its discovery as a, a discrete particle in 1932. And then we start to think about different isotopes along the way. So we're, we're starting to think of different masses of the elements, their isotopic masses, how many protons, neutrons, electrons a given element has around, these, around this time. And lastly, one, thing, one last thing worth kind of thinking about is the periodic table itself was, be, you know, began as a hypothesis in like 1870. I think we talk about this in chapter seven in a little bit more detail later. But 1870 is when we start to try to group elements into like the vertical columns being the elements that share some trends together. A lot of that arranging was done before we even really knew what most, or probably about half the elements even were at the time. So we're constructing a periodic table, leaving lots of gaps. We've, like, they even knew where to leave gaps where, where elements hadn't yet been discovered that later were able to be discovered. Um, so that's having 1870, good 30 years before we're discovering what actually makes elements different from each other. And so what ends up making elements different from each other is that proton. So the number of protons in the nucleus of a given atom is what we're going to find that sort of defines a given element. So it's that proton that really gives the element most of its, um, most of its properties and how it behaves. And then the electrons just kind of fill in the charge from there. So we'll talk a little bit about the nuclear theory as we get into the, the chapter a little further here. So again, Rutherford discovered or postulated or found from his work this small, um, dense positive charge where this is the protons and the neutrons of the um, atom. So the nucleus contains the protons and the neutrons. And then the, most of the actual volume of an atom is occupied by that relatively um, light electron. And when we get to chapter six, we'll talk about orbitals. You might remember like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, those sort of things. Like, the orbitals that electrons can be thought to reside in is a topic we'll talk about when we get to electronic structure um, topics in chapter six. But you can sort of already start to think that the electron being light, it's going to have to spin somehow around this atom. So electrons are going to be spinning in like wave patterns around uh, these nuclei. Um, and then those negative particles are going to repel positive particles. So they're going to give an atom its size. So atoms still can be pretty massive even though they have these relatively light electrons spinning around them because they carry charge and charge will repel other electrons. So put two atoms next to each other, maybe they'll form a bond but the electrons still have some repulsion for each other so it's not like the nuclei smack right into each other ever. The electrons charge help prevent that. So most of this, uh, um, most of the atom is empty space, really, if you think about it. So most of the atom is just the empty space between the electrons, but it's very useful space. It's space that those electrons need in order to um, spin around their nuclei. So most atoms are pretty small in terms of uh, a scale. They're so small we made up a scale to talk about how small they are. The um, angstrom scale, so one angstrom, so one angstrom is equal to a 10 to the minus 10 meter. Um, so it's like 10 to the minus 9 meters would be 1 nanometer from what we had seen on the nano unit being the minus 9. And then the next one after nano, if you remember, was 1 picometer, would be 10 to the minus 12 uh, meters. So the angstrom is somewhere between like a nanometer and a picometer. Um, angstrom as a, a unit is most commonly used for atomic size because it kind of gives us whole number sizes for um, atoms. Like their radii tend to be about one to five angstrom. Bond lengths between nuclei and atoms tend to be about one to two or three angstrom. So we can quantify things this angstrom unit. We'll use that predominantly for atomic size. And picometers used to be 100 to 500 picometers. Rarely, I'm sure there's examples that we, we can find at some point that we'll use um, nanometers or picometers for bond lengths, but more common that we'll use angstrom. And then, um, like we mentioned, the protons, neutrons in the nucleus, electrons orbit outside or spin outside that nucleus. So let's talk about the relative masses of the subatomic particles. And so um, these are what you call like resting masses. Um, 
one of the things that gets a little confusing is once you start to know that, for example, carbon-12 contains six protons, this here, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I just want to discuss this real quick. The, the 12 here is the mass number. This is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So if the mass number is, is 12 for carbon and it has six protons, it therefore has six neutrons. And so carbon therefore has to have six neutrons within this particular isotope of carbon. And then for it to be a neutral atom, for it not to carry a charge, it would therefore have to have six electrons. So the electron and the proton are opposite in signs of charge, but equal in magnitude. So the charge of the proton is the same magnitude as the electron. So in order for carbon to be neutral, six electrons, six protons, and carbon 12 would therefore have 12 minus six for six neutrons. Now, what I'm gonna try to portray to you here on the slide is that if you were to take the mass of 12 particles, six, six protons, six neutrons, add that up, and then the six electrons mass add those up, you're not going to come up with the mass of the carbon-12 nucleus. So these are the resting masses of these particles. Uh, when they actually form the nucleus, there's some stabilization of the nucleus. There's an interesting topic in like chapter 21, I don't think we even cover this anymore in 1220, but there's a nuclear stabilization energy. When those particles reside in the nucleus, they have net stability, which E equals mc squared. The, the stability drives the mass down of the nucleus as a result of that stabilization energy. The mass of this nucleus turns out to be exactly 12 AMU. We'll talk a little bit later why it's exactly 12 AMU. It's, it's how the AMU, the atomic mass scale, is defined. But you can see if I need to get 12.00000, as the atomic mass of carbon, I'm not getting there by taking the mass of the proton, which is just over an AMU, again, a resting mass. A neutron's mass is also just over an AMU. Um, if I take six of each of those, I'm gonna get obviously over 12. So I can't just come up with the mass of an isotope by summing up its subatomic particle resting masses. But then one thing worth noting here is that the negative electron, I, I mentioned opposite in sign of the charge of the proton, Notice its mass is really, really low. So its mass is, you know, 5.486 times 10 to the minus 4 atomic mass units. Now, the atomic mass unit scale, we'll talk, there's a slide on it later. Um, I don't think we'll get to it today. But we will talk about the atomic mass unit scale, and we'll use it probably a little bit more in problems when we get into Chapter 3, when we start thinking about moles and having collections of atoms. So just to kind of set the stage that we'll talk about this AMU unit um, a little bit later. Um, so, again, protons, neutrons reside in the nucleus, number of protons. Um, the, the proton count is what's defining that nucleus. So if we were to say, which you can't do, but let, let's say you could just inject it. Well, you can kind of do it. Physicists could do all kinds of things. Let's say chemists don't do this. Within a chemical reaction, we have a hard time adding a proton to an atom. But if I had some way of adding a proton into the nucleus of carbon, I would change it into the next element. So carbon, you can see the number six, it might be blocked by the screen, but carbon's atomic number is six. That's because it's defined as the element with six protons in its nucleus. If I could add a seventh proton, I'm changing it into nitrogen. So if I change the proton count, I change the positive particle count, I'm gonna drastically change the properties of that element as a result. Um, if I were to change the neutron count, then I would just have a different isotope. If I were to add a neutral particle, probably doesn't change the atom too much if you add or change that neutral particle count because you're not changing the plus minus balance. The plus minus balance is really what gives you know, how positive the charge is, how many electrons it has. Those are some of the key properties that an element has that define its properties. We talk about some of those later in chapter seven. But um, electrons and protons have identical but opposite charges. And then the atomic symbol, mass number, isotopes, that's where the, we'll be talking about how some atoms like carbon exists as like carbon-12. We'll see carbon-13 exists as a stable isotope of carbon that exists. Um, some, substances, <coughs> excuse me, some substances have carbon-14 within them. We can sometimes date an object on how old it is by how much carbon-14 it has remaining in it. Um, there's an interesting reason why that is. Um, it's because if you're taking in um, oxygen and nitrogen from your atmosphere, you're actually, those elements are decaying slowly to form a carbon-14 atom. And the moment you start, stop eating and stop living, you stop producing, you, you stop taking in the elements that are ultimately producing carbon-14, so your carbon-14 amount starts to drop. 
And then for about six to 10,000 years, I think you can date an object by how much carbon-14 it has remaining. So we see, and there's a slide on this in a minute, that there's only a very small trace, like less than 10 to the minus 10%, don't have to have that memorized, but less than 10 to the minus 10% of a carbon sample is carbon-14, about 99% is carbon-12, and about 1% is carbon-13. So very little carbon-14, but enough that it's useful to serve some purpose and to understand that some substances, living objects, um, and then for some period after they're not living, contain carbon-14. And then there's about 99% carbon-12, 1% carbon-13 within a sample of natural carbon. Now, why is that? That's an interesting question. Different um, elements can, can be comprised of different isotopes, and it really all depends on from the Big Bang and everything that's resulted from it and the elements that existed that are decaying, like say uranium decays slowly, gives off a helium nucleus, so we create helium in the process, and then a smaller element results from, from uranium, and then eventually that element decays. So you have elements going through natural decay processes that are giving off different um, isotopes or, or different uh, um, atoms that result off of those decay pathways. So you have um, all of these elements that have ever existed going through natural decay cycles that have given these isotopes are the ones that are stable enough to still exist and haven't decayed to something else. So if you're interested, there's a chapter on nuclear chemistry that kind of goes into some of that information, but that's kind of the reason why you see some different isotopes in a quick nutshell. Now let's just go through like how we can sort of uh, um, symbolically talk about different sort of isotopes of a given element. Um, whenever you see like copper-64, this is the mass number. And then whenever you see the atom symbol, like copper is Cu, that's, I mentioned before, it's, it's good for the first few rows of the periodic table to know the element name to symbol. That copper symbol is Cu, cobalt is Co, so maybe that's a little confusing. So cobalt is Co, we don't want to look at that element. But co copper, the mass number is what we write up here. Now, why do we call this the mass number? Well, the mass number is the sum of the particles that carry the most mass in the atom, the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So this is the sum of those two particles that actually carry a majority of the mass of the element. And so the sum of the protons and the neutrons of copper is 64. But copper is defined by its atomic number, which we can write down here in this symbolic. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons in the uh, nucleus. And this is the periodic table. This is the atomic number on the periodic table for the given element. So for copper, it's in the fourth row, and it's element number 29. There's a slide with a periodic table in it. If you scan ahead in your notes, if you want to see a, a periodic table in front of you, you can see that copper Cu is element number 29. So this number for copper would be 29, and that's the number of protons. So the number of neutrons should be 64 minus 29. I think that's 35. Yeah. So that should be about 35 neutrons within the copper atom. Now if copper is neutral, how many electrons would it contain? So let's, let's take a pause. So sometimes it's good to take a pause. So let's end with this question, or, or let's think about this question or even two questions. How many electrons does copper have? Even, you know, even trying to specify a neutral copper atom. And then how many does copper 2 plus have? So think about if we had an ion of copper, we had a net 2 plus charge, think about how many electrons that might have. You may not know how to calculate that, but think if you can come up with it. So we'll give you two or three minutes to think about these and we'll come back and answer these questions in a minute.
So how many how many electrons does does a neutral copper atom have? <coughs> so neutral carbon or neutral copper, I'm sorry. If we have 29 protons, so we have 29 protons, we have to have 29 electrons to balance out that charge. So obviously 29 electrons would be the right balance to have a neutral copper atom. So if we have no charge, nothing specified, that's a neutral atom. Sometimes you'll see this written, but usually we don't specify the zero charge or the neutral charge on an atom. If you see just an element without a charge, we're assuming that's a neutral atom. If you see an ion, now we'll talk about this as we go too, but think about how we would get to a two plus charge. You think we're gonna change the proton count? I can't change the proton count for two reasons. One, we would change copper into some other atom if we did. So if you could add or change the proton count, you would change the nature and the actual element, the symbol for the element. Uh, but then we can't really do that. It's not easy to change the protons because they're in that nucleus. They're kind of like locked into place. The electrons are spinning on the outside. We can have electrons kick off an atom much more easily than we can change the proton count. So to get to a net positive charge, we would have lost two electrons, right? To have a net two plus charge means we've lost two electrons. So we'd be down to 27 electrons. So we have 29 pluses, 27 minuses, net charge being plus two. Okay, now metals usually don't go minus, so most metals don't go negative in charge state. If we get to something like a chlorine atom, so chlorine, if we look, it's element number 17, would have 17 protons. <coughs> the neutron count usually doesn't matter too much. So like we're thinking about positive negative balance. So I'm not gonna worry about this. I'm not gonna worry about if it has 18 or 19 or however many neutrons that it might have. I would just know that it would have 17 electrons <coughs> if it were neutral in charge. And then if I add a minus charge onto it, then it's gonna have to pick up one electron. So chlorine with a net negative charge, have a net negative charge, we have to have more of the negative particles. So one more negative particle than positive particles. All right, so let's, let's look at a review. So I have a few of these problems just like um, in the notes in chapter two on sig fig problems. So why don't I give you guys a minute to think about this one. This is an old test question. I can almost remember the semester we gave this question. So we're assuming all these digits in this calculation represent inexact quantities. That's the most important part. Whenever you see this problem here, you're assuming that each one of those numbers is representing a value that's subject to like sig fig rules. So take a minute or two, think about how many sig figs this result should have. All right. How many people think it's, um, I don't think anybody probably thinks it's one. Does anybody think it's two sig figs? Kind of a trick answer. It's actually not two. Anybody think it's three? How about four? It is four. So now the trick here is sometimes if you went with two, I bet you were like, okay, two sig figs multiplying. Because multiplication is in the step and I see two, two sig figs, we have to round the two. 
we have to be careful. This result here gets rounded to two sig figs. So the result of 2.5 times 0.295 is 0 0.7375. So when I look at this step here, that this rounds to two sig figs. So this would round to 0.74 from the multiplication rule. Then when I carry out the subtraction, it's all about decimal places. And we round to the higher decimal place, that hundredths place of the 0.74. And so we're gonna end up with four sig figs. So the actual result would be 11.53. <coughs> now, there's some like question or some like topics on, should you round at the end of the problem or should you round, you know, so like this value here, should I have kept it at 7375 and rounded at the end? On test questions, I say just round off your values so you don't confuse yourself or make a mistake. In a laboratory experiment, when you're doing like calculation A to B to C to D, and if the A should be rounded to three sig figs, I would usually keep the fourth around just for the next step. And then when I need to report A, I round it back to three. Does that make sense? So sometimes you might carry an extra sig fig or two in a calculation so you don't introduce like rounding errors. Um, so you can think that's more appropriate for lab. I don't outthink test questions though. At test questions, I'm just rounding at the 0.74, not thinking too hard just to make sure I get the right sig fig count on the question. All right, so here's that periodic table I mentioned. We'll talk about some of the trends of the alkali, the alkaline metals, and define some of those terms um, in a couple of slides later. This is good to refer to later. So we can see the assembly of you know, our, our sort of, some of our gases on the right side, some of our metals on the left side of the periodic table. And then just making sure, at least for the first four rows, and then you'll start to see some examples of some elements we use beyond there that we just want to make sure to go name to symbol, symbol to name. We usually don't try to like get too tricky with the one sound here early in the class just because, you know, like if we start talking about rhenium versus rhodium versus, um, you know, that that's kind of hard to, versus ruthenium also have very sim similar symbols. So if we do an example with say like ruthenium in 1210, usually we're like making sure that we give you the symbol so you know which element to look for if you need to use a periodic table. Okay. so. I might have been getting ahead of myself with that question earlier on chlorine, but so here, what is the sum of the protons, neutrons, and electrons for the following ion? Since we already thought about this one, let's think about this one together. So here we're given the mass number, chlorine with a negative charge. Now, this being the mass number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. I still have to look at the periodic table here, or the one in your notes, um, to come up with 17 protons. So we have 17 protons. And then we therefore would have the difference from 35, so 18, electro, uh, 18 neutrons. So we have 18 neutrons, 17 protons. And then for the negative charge, which we were talking about earlier, to have a net negative charge means we picked up an electron. So we have one more electron than protons, so 18 electrons. I don't like to get too fancy because you, know, you can think about how the charge is, you know, maybe the number of protons minus the number of electrons is the charge. I mean, to me, it's just like the thought of the balance of the plus and the minus. And then we're not changing the plus. The plus is set by being chlorine. So the only way we're changing the charge is by adjusting the electron count. So again, net negative, we have to pick up an extra electron. And so 35 plus 18, because since we're just summing up all these particles to answer this particular question, would be 53 total subatomic particles within one ion of um, chlorine. How many protons and electrons does lead 2 plus contain as another example? Let's again think of this one together. I won't break you into, you know, thinking about this one first on your own. But for lead, now lead, like it's element 82, bigger element. Um, one we maybe have seen before, hopefully we've seen PB as being lead, um, but lead 2 plus element 82, so 82 protons. And then again, we don't need to, sometimes we're confused on what the mass number is. We don't need to know how many neutrons lead has in order to determine its electron count. So the electron count is only based on the nucleus itself, 82 protons, and then the charge. 
So to pick up a net positive charge means we've lost two electrons. So we'd be down here, 82 protons, 80 electrons. So the, I think this will be our last slide for today. This is just how we came to know uh, for a given element, how do we know what its different isotopes that it exists as? We do an experiment called a mass spectrometry experiment where you can put a charge onto an atom and then you can bend it through a magnetic field, kind of the same basic wand approach as through an instrument. And then you can try to see where do you get signal. For chlorine, you get signal at the mass number 35 and 37 within a natural sample. So within this experiment here is how within, you know, you can do this with carbon, you can do this with chlorine, you name the element, you can try to see what isotopes exist and then what are their masses. So you get their isotopic masses from which you can determine the different neutron counts for those atoms. So this is just chlorine with 18 neutrons. This is chlorine with uh, 20 neutrons. So different elements can exist with different numbers of neutrons. We see this from mass spectrometry experiments. So we'll pick up after the slide uh, uh, on uh, whatever day is next, Friday. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. See you guys. I have a silly question. Are we going to do anything with carbon